All right, so today we're going to be talking about coevolution and life history trade-offs. These are two separate categories. They, they, they certainly can be connected, but uh, they are two different things going on here. Um, but let's start uh, by talking about coevolution. So coevolution is the influence of closely associated species on each other in their evolution. And a great example of this would be this bird here and this flower, both of which have really extreme phenotypes. And they have driven each other to these phenotypes because, again, of coevolution. I think before we start talking about that, let's look at our like key terms for today. The terms are evolution, coevolution, mimicry. Under the category of mimicry, there is Batesian and Malarian. Um, and there's also this idea of aposematism and trade-offs, all of which we are going to talk about. But before we talk about coevolution, I think we need to define evolution first. So what even is evolution? A very texty definition is evolution is the change in heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. And this is not the last time uh, we're going to speak about evolution. Uh, we're going to have a whole um, section on it later on in the semester, but this is the idea of what evolution is. It's the change in a population over time. Okay, so this is the upper one is sort of like a more texty version of it, but you can just think about evolution as a change in a population over time, as is the case with uh, Darwin's finches uh, right here. Later on, we're going to think of evolution as a change in allele frequencies in a population over time. This is not important right this minute, but we're going to be seeing this concept again later on. So I just want you to sort of have seen the term allele frequencies, and we'll circle back to this later. So we've, we've defined evolution as a change in a population over time. So now what is coevolution? The coevolution, the, the text definition here is the influence of closely, excuse me, the influence of closely associated species on each other in their evolution. And so this is a very classic example. These are Heliconius butterflies. Um, they are not um, related to one another. These are all different species. Uh, but as you can see, uh, they look quite similar, okay? And these, these um, organisms are, are driving one another's evolution. So when might coevolution take place? Um, and it is during any interspecific interaction. So it's during those community interactions that we learned about uh, in previous lectures. So here is a bee that was going to get some pollen and it wound, or actually it was going to get some nectar, and it wound up covered in whatever plant it was pollinating pollen. <laughs> so uh, the, the development of nectar in plants is a really fantastic, fantastic example of coevolution, because the plants evolved this nectar so that they could attract things like bees and hummingbirds and wasps and all kinds of insects. Um, so that they could get pollinated. And so plants evolved nectar so that they could attract um, insects. Insects evolved uh, the ability to not only eat that nectar, but to be able to forage and get it as a result of the plants evolving it. So that's a really great example of coevolution. You also find examples in uh, predator-host interactions. You'll find it in predator-prey interactions, and you'll find it in symbiosis and uh, you know, symbiosis was like parasitism and uh, mutualism from, from last time. If you're lost on symbiosis, go check out the previous lecture. Um, but you're, you're going to see it pretty much during any kind of those community interactions. Okay, it's species, different species influencing one another's evolutionary process. So an example of a, a predator-prey interaction uh, is this newt here. This is Tarika terosa. Um, this is a newt that you can find all over California, not really in the Central Valley as much. They, they may be here, but you can definitely find them um, in the Diablo range, and you can find them in the Sierra Nevada. Um, so you can find them in, in the mountains all around us uh, in the Central Valley. And so their, their co-evolution has taken place with their predator, and this is the uh, terrestrial garter snake. Okay, so these snakes eat these newts. And so you might be saying, well, where is the, where is the coevolution happening? The coevolution is happening uh, because the newts are actually quite toxic. Okay, so the newts 
uh, have evolved this toxicity such that they can not be eaten by these garter snakes. Okay, oops. And, you know, these newts are, are very, very toxic. In fact, this is the most uh, toxic animal in uh, California. Funny story about that. This is my uh, this is my uncle and oops. This is my uncle and we were out backpacking a long time ago and we found a dead newt on the ground and he picked it up and, and pretended to eat it. Uh, and then I brought this picture and showed it to my friend who's a herpetologist and she said, "Oh my God, is your uncle okay?" <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, he's fine. What are you talking about?" And she said, "That's the most toxic animal." in all of California, and I knew that newts were toxic, but I didn't realize how toxic uh, they were. This one was already dead, by the way. He did not eat it. He walked away from this trip unscathed. Uh, but yeah, Tarika terosa has developed this toxicity in order to prevent being eaten. But the thing is, the snake has come back, and it's developed resistance to the toxicity. <laughs> It, it has itself evolved a way around the newt's uh, mechanism of protecting itself. So you'll find that when, whenever you have newts that are very, very toxic, you have snakes that are very, very resistant. And that is the co-evolutionary process driving itself. The, the snake eats the newt, the newt becomes toxic, so the snake develops resistance. So the newt becomes more toxic, so the snake becomes more resistant. It's this... Uh, it's this, it, they call it the Red Queen Hypothesis uh, because of uh, Alice in Wonderland where, you know, you, you are running and running and running as fast as you can just to stay in the same spot. Uh, but this is a great example of the co-evolutionary process. And embedded within this idea is the idea of a trade-off. So the newt produces a tetrodotoxin. Uh, which is the same toxin that you'll find in puffer fish and, and certain kinds of other other animals. But if if the newt produces too little tetrodotoxin, they're more likely to be eaten. But the thing is, the production of toxin is not is not free. I mean, you put free in air quotes. But these newts don't just get to make toxin in their bodies without having some price to pay. So if they don't make enough, they're more likely to be eaten, but they also produce more offspring. Whereas if they make too much toxin, they're less likely to be eaten, but then they produce fewer offspring because, again, it's not free to just make toxins inside your body. The snake also undergoes trade-offs. If it doesn't have enough resistance, it can't eat newts. But... Again, it's not free to develop resistance to this stuff. So its metabolism is actually different, and it is allowed to crawl faster if it doesn't have a lot of this resistance. And so maybe it can try to find something else other than these newts to eat. The other end of the spectrum, if it has too much resistance, it's able to eat all whatever toxic newt it wants, but it can't crawl as fast. And so maybe it can catch less of other kinds of prey. So this is an example of both co-evolution and an evolutionary trade-off. Okay, so trade-offs are something that you, that you should be keeping in mind. What is the animal selecting, what is the species selecting evolutionarily to give it the most success? So another kind of co-evolution is this idea of, of mimicry, like I was talking about before. And this is, this is sort of like the, the textbook example. These are Heliconius butterflies. They're kind of related to one another, but these are all different species. And as you can see, they all look quite similar, not identical. You know, there are differences here. If you, if you, if you study these carefully, you'll find differences. But the reason they look like one another is because they all want to look similar so that they can all be under the protection of their toxicity. And what I mean by that is, if you are a predator and you eat a butterfly that is bright orange with black stripes and you get sick, you're not going to eat that again. You're, you're, it's gonna be a warning sign to you. Uh, and this kind of warning coloration, by the way, where they're very brightly colored, is called aposematism. 
So when a toxic species is very brightly colored, it's called aposematism. But what's happening here is these butterflies are evolving to look more and more like each other so that they all get protection from predators. So all of these butterflies are, are somewhat toxic and they're all evolving to look similar to one another so that they can be protected from predators. The, the text definition of this is malarian mimicry is a natural phenomenon in which two or more well-defended, well-defended meaning toxic uh, in this case, in, in which two or more well-defended species, often foul-tasting and that share common predators, have come to mimic each other's honest warning signals to their mutual benefit. So again, it's, it's kind of like these two butterflies are saying to each other, hey, I'm toxic, hey, you're toxic, let's look like each other so that if one of us gets eaten, we can all be protected. And they're obviously not saying that to each other. These butterflies don't even really recognize each other's patterns. It's just the underlying evolutionary process that's making them change to look similar. And another way without, you know, trying to think about all of those like wordy definition, it's two harmful or toxic species evolving to look more like one another. So that is malarian mimicry. That's a word you should know, malarian mimicry. We also have Batesian mimicry, which is when a harmless species has evolved to imitate the warning signals of a harmful species directed at a predator of them both. And so this is a great example. This is the, a viceroy butterfly. These, I believe, only live on the East Coast. And then you have the monarch butterfly, which um, hopefully you guys are familiar with. They, they travel, they go all the way from Mexico through the United States and they stop through, um, they stop through California um, every so often. But monarchs, because of the plant they eat when they're larva, because they eat milkweed, monarchs are actually toxic or at least very, very nasty tasting to, to birds and, and whatever's trying to eat them. Viceroy butterflies are delicious. These guys taste great. They are palatable. They do not have any toxic, any toxicity or anything. So what the viceroy is doing is it is evolving over time to look more and more like the monarch butterfly. And you can see they're, they're different uh, if you study them side by side. But if you were to find one out, you know, in nature, unless you're an expert, you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference. And if you're a predator, you're certainly not going to be able to tell the difference. Okay. So again, what's happening here is Batesian mimicry, a, a, a delicious species evolving to look like a nasty species so that it doesn't get eaten. Uh, and here I have a picture of a fly on the left, a wasp in the middle, and a bee on the right. So flies are not defended. They do not sting. They do not bite. Uh, so if you're a predator, you can just eat them. Wasps and bees do sting, and uh, wasp bite as well. And so what kind of mimicry is happening between the wasp and the bee? It's two dangerous species, two defended species evolving to look more like one another. Okay, this is malarian mimicry. The fly evolving to look like these two is Batesian mimicry because the fly doesn't do anything. The fly can't do much. You can you can eat the fly if you're if you're a predator, but if you see a fly that's bright yellow, you're going to think, uh-oh, that's a wasp or that's a bee. So between the fly and the wasp and the bee is Batesian mimicry. is a non-defended species evolving to look like a well-defended species. And between the wasp and the bee is malarian mimicry. Two defended species evolving to look more like one another so that they can both gain protection from predators. And again, this signaling this, these bright colors, it's telling you, hey, I'm a wasp, don't screw with me. Okay, the same thing for the bee. These bright yellow colors, it, it's the animal signaling to predators, hey, don't mess with me, I, I am very toxic, I will mess you up. And that is called aposematism. Okay, next time we're going to talk about invasive species involving the delightful California tiger salamander and the barred salamander, which has been brought in uh, from elsewhere.